yes, we're almost done with chapter 14. Uh, just to touch upon one little, um, you know, the last few verses, verses 30 and 31. If we could have, have someone read out John chapter 14, verses 30 and 31, please. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claims on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so here, um, Jesus makes it very clear that the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. Okay, so the reason that Jesus is going to the cross is not because Satan has some kind of hold over him, that Jesus has failed in some way, has committed some sin, and because of that, uh, Satan can now drive him to the cross and to, and to punishment and death. No, that's not the reason why Jesus is going to the cross. He is rather going to the cross because he wants to show to the world that he obeys his father, that he submits to him, uh, even to the extent of you know giving his life on the cross. So he says over here, um, the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the father and do exactly what my father has commanded me. So the only reason that the prince of the world is able to come and do what he is about to do, you know, um, uh, cause the cross. Uh, and all of that agony and all of that to happen. The prince is able to do this. The prince of this world is able to do this only because Jesus has chosen to submit to the Father and allow all of this to take place. Uh, none of this is happening because Satan has any kind of hold over Jesus. He does not. Okay, so um, uh, John chapter 14 ends with that. And then Jesus moves into the very, very popular chapter uh, of John chapter 15, which talks about the vine and the branches. So uh, uh, if we could have someone read out John chapter 15, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. Yes. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful you are already clean because of the because of the word i have spoken to you thank you yes um, now some of the commentaries say that uh, jesus spoke these words in connection with the uh, temple the, the jerusalem temple which you know herod had built uh, because they say that uh, the front entrance of the Jerusalem temple was decorated with a golden um, wine, you know, like a, like a grape wine, a kind of creeper. So you would have the creeper, the golden creeper, uh, you know, you know, entwining itself all around the 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 both the the the, 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 the posts on the two sides and even the on on the top. So it's like as if there's a framework of gold creeper uh, framing the doorway, the main entrance, and then people would enter through that uh, entry point. And why was this Jerusalem temple uh, decorated in that way? Uh, why did you have a golden wine uh, you know, um, right there in the entrance gate? Uh, it's because the wine usually symbolized the nation of Israel. In the Old Testament, there are passages where it talks about uh, the nation of Israel as being a grape wine. So um, maybe drawing from that imagery, uh, you, know, you know, when Herod had the designing done, uh, they had this entrance, the temple entrance being constructed uh, in that way with this kind of uh, beautiful golden uh, wine creeper. Um, forming the uh, you know the it's, it's a kind of um, a mar a kind of outline you know uh, decorating the main entrance so um, but we generally notice that um, in the old testament um, wherever the wine is mentioned wherever israel is compared to a wine it tends to do so in a negative sense um, 
we will we'll get to that uh, we'll get you brother in a minute if i would just like to you know um, look at these verses first uh, psalm 88 to 9 if someone could read out psalm 88 to 9 psalm 80 Eight and eight zero. Nine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Psalm 80, 8 and 9. You have brought a wine out of Egypt. You have cast mm -hmm. out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root and it filled the land. Amen. So this is definitely Israel that is being spoken of here. Uh, the Lord... Uh, transplants the wine takes the wine from um, uh, from egypt and he now plants it over here in the promised land and it uh, takes root and it fills the entire land of canaan uh, but however in spite of what the lord has done the people fall away you know uh, from their faithful walk and uh, that is where you have all these negative examples of the wine being used in the old testament uh, and we will just look out look at one single reference uh, Isaiah 5 7. If someone could read out Isaiah 5 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plan. Mm. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression, for righteousness. But behold, a cry for help. Amen. So the Lord plants this wine and he's hoping that he's going to get wonderful fruit from it. But what does he get? The fruit that he sees is only bloodshed and, uh, you know, cries of distress uh, where people are being oppressed and taken advantage of. So uh, he plants the wine expecting much, but he gets almost nothing from it. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the wine, this is the creeper uh, of Israel that is being talked about over here. And uh, yeah, we'll continue with that. Uh, but then we had um, uh, one of the persons raising their hand. I I think it was Brother Shei, I'm not very sure. Uh, you know, yeah, whoever had raised their hand, you know, if you could... Uh, yeah, present your thoughts or your question. Yes, go ahead, please. No, no, it, it was just a question, Pastor. I just wanted to know if you had a picture of um, the uh, the vine yard you talked about, the Herod had. Maybe a picture of it just to give an idea. Yeah, I know. I mean, um, it's all, I mean, you know, the, the Romans, of course, destroyed the temple, right? So uh, all the beautiful things that Herod had done, all the construction work is all gone. But then in, when you look in Google clip art, you just have, um, you know, I know, I mean, imagined imageries of what it must have looked like. Uh, so if you just type in Google, um, if, you, if you type in Google, great golden wine of Jerusalem temple, you will get these, um, you know, pictures. But then those are all just your computer renderings of what it must have looked like. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, you could just go to Google maybe and look, uh, great golden wine of the uh, Jerusalem temple. That should be enough. It will give you a whole bunch of uh, computer rendered images uh, of what it must have looked like. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So we talked about the, um, uh, the nation of Israel whom God had planted with great hopes, but the fruit which they yielded uh, was very disappointing, not what God had wanted. Now, Jesus says, I am the true wine. Okay, so there's a contrast being made over here. Israel was a very bad wine. It did not produce what was expected. On the other hand, Jesus says, I am the true wine. I am the wine that is able to produce fruit which pleases God, uh, which is in line with his will. And now if you people are willing to, uh, you know, uh, believe in me and submit to me and become part of me, abide in me, then through me, you also will be able to produce fruit, uh, which will be pleasing to the Lord. 
because the nation of Israel was unable to please the Lord. Uh, they failed miserably, and the Lord was very angry with them. On the other hand, we who choose to abide in Jesus uh, because he is the true vine, we don't have to end up like the Israelites. Uh, we can bear fruit in and through Jesus. We, are, we will be able to bear fruit which will be pleasing to the Lord. So he, we are being given a second chance. We are being given a glorious opportunity uh, you know, to not be like the uh, be like the false wine, the traitorous wine of the Old Testament, you know, the nation of Israel. So rather than be like them, we can be different. So that is why Jesus starts off with these words and he says, I am the true wine. And he goes on to say, you know, if you abide in me, then through me, uh, with my ability, with my grace, you will be able to bring out fruit, uh, which will be acceptable to the Lord. Uh, so that is that is why Jesus begins with those words talking about himself as being the true wine uh, now um, there's a little bit of you know um, debate not a little bit a lot of debate uh, regarding the second verse um, where it says every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away okay the greek word over there which is used uh, for taking away or lifting lift, being lifted up that is the greek verb Airo, A I R O. Um, so it can be used in the sense of something being lifted up, or it can be uh, taken in the sense of something being, you know, taken away. Uh, it could be taken in either sense. So, which is why one uh, scholar came up with this uh, different translation, uh, a person named Boyce. Um, and he uh, said that in this verse, Jesus is not talking about taking away a person you know who is not bearing fruit he's just saying that he's going to lift them up so that you know they'll receive more sunshine they will re receive more uh, nutrition and they will be able to recover and grow and all of that and uh, bruce wilkinson you know who's a popular writer he really enjoyed that whole concept and so he wrote an entire book uh, called secrets of the wine uh, where he talks about how uh, uh, this verse is actually talking about people who have maybe backslidden uh, but then now God is going to give them a second chance he's going to lift them up from the ground uh, so that they will receive more sunshine and so um, you know he will he will um, restore them uh, but most scholars uh, disagree with this uh, because over here there's a contrast being presented in verse 2 it's talking about two categories you have people who are not bearing fruit and something is going to be done to them versus the people who are bearing fruit and then something will be done to them so there are two categories being talked about there's a there's a kind of contrast being presented over here so we probably may have to stick with the traditional translation which seems to make sense uh, because even later on, you know, Jesus goes back to talking about how these uh, useless uh, branches which are not bearing any fruit uh, they would be they would be you know judged and punished so uh, we have to go by, i think probably with the traditional understanding of this uh, greek word airo where it means that something is being taken away and yeah in in um, some of our um, versions it will say being cut away you know it's it's being it's being cut it's been it's being cut and taken off uh, so in that sense so every branch that does not bear fruit he takes it away on the other hand the ones which are bearing fruit they are given a pruning so that they can you know produce even more uh, fruit so uh, the pruning is being done uh, to make them even more fruitful and the word prune uh, again in the in the greek in the ancient greek that word prune it could be used for um, you know doing the actual pruning where they, where they chop the edges so that it grows better or it could also talk about cleansing cleaning uh, so that word greek word which is used over there it's a word which can be used either for the pruning process or even for the cleaning process so those who are bearing fruit they are pruned they are cleaned uh, they are prepared for even greater uh, fruitfulness the lord is pleased with them on the other hand the branches which are not bearing any fruit uh, you know uh, they would be uh, removed so 
this is basically what is being conveyed over here in these initial verses. Uh, let's move in and you know look at this in greater detail. And uh, yeah, we will be dwelling upon these aspects, you know, in greater detail. So let's move into verses uh, four. Um, OK, let's just uh, if, we, if somebody could just read only verse four for us, please. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. Yeah. Uh, so when you say abide, abide will obviously not be a one time event. Um, abide is something that happens on a continual basis. Uh, so a person would have to choose even when there, are, when there are trials, when there are difficulties, that person would make a choice to continue being faithful to Christ, to continue submitting to him. Even when the Lord asks something tough from us, which we don't feel like doing, we would have to continue abiding in him. So over here, when Jesus says, abide in me, is uh, talking about a person who has made a lifetime commitment. They have made up their mind that they are going to follow Jesus. He is going to be the Lord and master of their lives. And uh, uh, by his grace, he's going to forgive them of their sins and take them you know, to heaven with him one day. So they have made this kind of commitment. So those are the kind of people uh, that it talks about over here when it says, abide in me and I in you. So such people, um, you know, they will bear fruit. Um, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. OK, so uh, it's talking about a, a lifelong commitment that we have made. Those of us who call ourselves followers of the Lord, this is the commitment that we have made to continue in him in spite of persecution, uh, in spite of the difficult demands that he may be making of us, uh, we make a lifetime commitment to him. Um, OK, um, well, let's look at verses 5 and 6, because now we are coming back to the branches you know, which um, are not bearing fruit. Uh, if, if we could read out verses 5 and 6. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and others. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. OK, so um, uh, he says here, the Lord says here, uh, for without me, okay, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Uh, now, uh, you know, people say, how can this be true? Uh, we have an entire, you know, world full of human beings who are doing good deeds. So how can we say that, you know, they are doing nothing? They are doing good. Uh, they are, you know, uh, running charity projects. They are helping hundreds of people uh, you know so uh, there are good deeds being done on a daily basis uh, so even apart from christ even apart from a uh, from a personal fellowship with the lord it is possible to do good works is you know is the argument which some people raise so over here when it says for without me you can do nothing it's talking more about in the uh, eternal aspect uh, whatever you have done it will not have eternal value. It's there now for now. It benefits a few people now, but uh, it will not have eternal value. Because over here, Jesus is talking about someone who's going to be abiding in him. And the, these people who abide in him, they're going to be in him, not just up to their death, even beyond death. You know, they're going to be with him always, forever and ever. So here, uh, Jesus is talking about eternal things. Um, and uh, so a person who may be doing good works apart from Jesus, apart from a walk with him, yes, those are good deeds, uh, but they will not have any eternal fruit. Uh, those things will not have will, will not have any eternal benefits for the person doing those things. Uh, so uh, we'll look at an example, OK? Um, Acts chapter 10, verse 22. Now, we're all very familiar with this story. But you know, let's try and look at this uh, story from the angle of what Jesus is talking about over here regarding uh, wine, regarding branches that bear fruit and branches that do not bear fruit. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 22, if we could have someone read out. And they said, 
present Cornelius a centurion and a pride in God fearing man who is well spoken of spoken of by the whole Jewish nation. Was oh, okay, okay. It's so sorry. If we can maybe just have a verse um, 30. Yeah, Acts 10, verse 30. <laughs> Lot of I laughter and joy. Said four days ago about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer had been heard and your arms have been remembered before God. Okay, so here is a very good godly man. And in fact, you know, in the introduction, it says that he is a, you know, that, that, that was actually verse 22, where he talks about how he was a God fearing man. And uh, most scholars will say that the term over there that is used, God fearing man, it's not just talking about a man who feared God, but it's a technical term, a God fearer. Uh, because uh, when these Jewish people uh, were scattered, they were taken into captivity to Babylon, and then they, from there, they you know they spread out to other places, to Elam, to Persia, and all that. Um, and of course, some of them had gone to Egypt. Uh, so some of these Jews, uh, you know, who held on to their faith, uh, these people, uh, they began to talk about Yahweh in all of those lands where they were living. Uh, so they were doing a little bit of missionary activity, a little bit of witnessing, and the people who uh, began to uh, accept Yahweh as their God and began to follow him and and the people who stopped following other idols and completely devoted themselves to the worship of Yahweh uh, these Gentile people uh, were given the term uh, God fearers so it looks like Cornelius was one of this category uh, he is a man who had been following other gods but after hearing the truth about Yahweh, he chooses to become a Yahweh follower. So he becomes a God fearer. Uh, so in that sense, he converts to the Jewish faith. And after converting to the Jewish faith, we see that he's an honorable man, a man who actually spends time in prayer. And he also gives uh, you know, alms, that word ALMS, it's your very ancient English, which is basically means you know, giving um, money to the poor, doing acts of charity and uh, helping those in need. So he's involved in all of those activities. Okay, So here is a man who is doing good deeds. He is a person who has, in fact, even converted to the Jewish religion. And he is doing good deeds. And um, what does uh, Peter say about him? Uh, verses 34 and 35. Uh, if we could read out verses 34 and 35 in Acts chapter 10 itself. Please. <laughs> 34 and 35. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation and anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Okay, so, so Peter says, uh, the Lord does accept from every nation those who are fearing him and who are you know, doing their best to do what is right. So God does uh, honor that. He does recognize that. And then uh, if we can look at verses 42 to 44. This is where uh, you know Peter is giving the salvation message. Verses 42, 42 to 44. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Okay, so... Um... So Peter begins by saying that God accepts from every nation the people who fear him, the ones who are doing right. And then he begins to give the gospel message of, of what Jesus has done and who he is. And he explains in verse 42 that Jesus is the one who has been appointed by God as the judge. So everyone will have to stand before 
one single judge, Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, so uh, if, if you want to escape judgment on that day, it says in verse 43, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And even as the crowd sitting over there uh, was hearing these words in their heart, they must have believed. And uh, so immediately as they begin to believe, the Holy Spirit comes down upon them. Uh, and so they, you know, they are brought into the fold of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so we, we see that um, um, Cornelius was a God fearer. He who had chosen to become a Jew uh, and he was also a person who was doing good deeds. He was doing acts of charity, but that alone was not enough. Even as he was praying and seeking God, God revealed to him that something more is needed. So God, uh, he says, you know, he says in verse 30, uh, Cornelius is speaking in verse 30 and he says, three days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour. And when he was praying, uh, the angel comes and says to him, uh, you know, you need to go and call certain uh, a certain person and they will tell you what more you need to do. So just doing those good deeds was not enough. Something more was required and that something more is explained by Peter once he arrives. So he explains that they're all, they're all going to be standing in front of the judge one day who is Jesus Christ and the ones who have chosen to believe in him and have a personal commitment to him, they are the ones who will receive forgiveness. So um, it was not enough that Pete Cornelius was doing good works. Uh, all his good works would have been like, you know, for without me, you can do nothing. It would have just been that. On the other hand, when he chose to abide in the vine, when he chose to become a part of Jesus, that is when uh, his good works would have had eternal benefits. Okay, so there's a there's a great difference between just doing good works on our own and uh, doing good works as a result of our walk with Jesus, because uh, one will have one will have eternal um, uh, fruit, one will have eternal results, and the other will just be a good thing which God recognizes as being good, but uh, there is no eternal fruit attached. Which is why it says in Romans chapter one verse twenty that anyone who looks at creation they can see that and understand that God exists. Because creation so clearly demonstrates that there is a creator, that someone has made these things. And so creation is witnessing and testifying that there is a God in existence. Uh, but that is not enough. We need to know who exactly is that God. So people who are willing to seek the way Cornelius was seeking and praying to such people, God will reveal that it is Jesus through Jesus, they can have access to this creator. So uh, it's a revelation that God will give to people who are genuinely seeking. And then they can come into the fold of Jesus Christ. They can become part of the true vine. And then they will bear fruit, which will have uh, eternal results. So we need to understand this uh, passage in that context. Uh, so in verses 7 and 8, you know, Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. So uh, it's all about being in him and bearing fruit through him. Only then are you a disciple. Only then can you are you considered a part of his family. OK, so um, these are all uh, things that you know are brought out in this passage. Uh, let's look at verses 9, 10, and 11. Uh, yeah. Can I read faster? Yes. Yeah. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Yeah, there are two very nice things that we see. Uh, there are many nice things, but then uh, you know, two which I would just like to uh, emphasize. Uh, he says, "As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you." 
so maybe you know we should just uh, sit back and reflect a little bit on how did the father love jesus to what extent uh, what is the uh, height and depth and the width of the father's love for jesus because jesus says with that same kind of love i have loved you so um, uh, if we have an understanding of the great love that the father has for jesus uh, we need to realize that, that same level of love is what jesus feels for us so you know when there are days when we when the, when we are going through tough times and we feel uh, rejected by god we need to remember to the, the extent to which we are loved it says as the father has loved me you know with that amazing complete total love that the father has loved jesus in the same way jesus says i have loved you so uh now next he says now remain in my love if you keep my commands you will remain in my love so we are not keeping these commandments to earn jesus love we are already loved uh, because you know we have chosen to come now come to him and be part of the true vine so now we are in him and we have his love we already have his love so we are not keeping the commandments to earn his love rather we are keeping the commandments to remain in his love to stay within those within those safe boundaries you know that safe fence inside which we can experience his love and experience his abundance because if we choose to step outside that fence if we choose to go outside that boundaries we would be exposed to the works of satan and uh, we would no longer be able to enjoy his love and his protection and his blessing so uh we are keeping the commandments uh, not to earn his love we are loved we are keeping the commandments so that we can remain in his love and stay secure and enjoy all that we are meant to uh because outside the boundary outside that fence uh, there's nothing but misery you know uh you just have uh, uh, temporal pleasures and uh, satan will soon see to it that you begin to you know enjoy the consequences of your temporal pleasures and this no no lasting joy uh, nothing that we can really look forward to uh, so jesus says remain in my love keep my commandments so that you can remain in my love is the advice that he gives his people um here uh, this is also another important point okay um maybe we can get to that a little later okay yeah uh, verses 12 13 maybe only verses 12 and 13 if someone could read out for us please 12 and 13 this is my commandment that you love one another as i have loved you greater love has no one than this that son they done his life for his friends okay so um, so jesus says uh, remain in my love by keeping my commandment and what is the commandment that he is giving the commandment is giving is that we should love each other just as uh, jesus has loved us uh, so um, by doing that we will stay safe by doing that we will be able to remain in his love and uh, if we are really wondering you know exactly how we are supposed to love each other you have a very lovely uh, summary in ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 to 31 where it talks about some of the things that you can do very practical things that you can do you know to express your love for one another uh, because when we go to ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 to 31 it talks about how you need to put off your old Yeah, maybe we can just read those two verses, three verses. Uh, if we, yeah, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. Twenty-four. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Thank you. Yeah. So there are three things that are being talked about over here. You know. Um, the former way of life which we had uh, where we always used to place our interests first 
and only think about what we can gain and how we can benefit uh, we need to put off that old self we need to take it off put it off and now what are we doing we are putting on a new self uh, the new self which god wants and how do we do that we do it uh, by being made new in the attitude of our minds it is god who does it you know he will make us new in the attitude of our minds if we cooperate with him if we are willing to submit to him and say yes lord the way i have been living is selfish self centered now i am choosing to change my thinking and cooperate with you so that you can renew me in my attitude so that i can have this different uh, way of life and then it goes on to explain some of the ways in which you can express your love to one another it says don't speak falsehood you know don't lie to each other it says do not stay angry but you know uh, to uh, to res uh, to resolve that issue with the other person it talks about not stealing from the other person and then verses 29 to 32 are very very lovely it talks about how you know you can really express your love for one another it says only speak those things which will build up the other person not things which tear down people uh, not things you know which are gossipy in nature uh, and it says you know do not grieve the holy spirit um because by doing such things you know when you when you when you're, when you're tearing people down um you're not just tearing them down you're also grieving the holy spirit uh, so um it, it says not to do that and so in that context it says get rid of all bitterness rage and anger uh, I, 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 and, and what, what are the other terms yeah brawling and slander and malice so these are all things that you need to put off the old self you know you need to put off those things instead what are you supposed to be putting on be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other so no matter what the other person is doing to you no matter how hurtful they are being uh, your first thought should be how can i show kindness and compassion to this person you know emotions are emotions uh, you you will feel anger when those people are uh, uh, hurtful or uh, deliberately uh, cruel you know so you will feel anger uh, you will feel uh, um, you know that they should be punished so you would feel all of those things because those are the you know natural human reactions but even as you are feeling all of those things what is the decision that you uh, that you take you you decide the lord has said to remain in his love by keeping his commandment to love one another therefore in what way can i show kindness to this person in what way can i be compassionate to this person and you know act in forgiveness towards them so uh, we choose to do this um, as an act of obedience to the lord so that we can remain in his love so that we can stay safe inside that fence of his uh, love um okay just a minute please i think this um so sorry sometimes this laptop yes i think that should be on right yeah okay so uh, um we choose to remain in his love by keeping his commandment and the commandment is given in verse 12 my command is this love each other as i have loved you then it goes on to say something else that is very very important um if we maybe if someone could read out for us uh, verse 14 and 15 yeah if someone could read out you are my friends if you do what i command I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in, in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the father told me. Yeah. Uh so here Jesus talks about the contrast, the difference between a slave and a friend. A slave is someone that you uh purchase and that person is uh being used to serve your purposes. you know you want to get jobs done and so you use the slave to get your work done um but on the other hand uh, a a friend is someone with you with whom you build up a relationship you're not just using them 
they're not there just to serve you rather you are sharing yourself with them you know your thoughts your desires uh, the ambitions that you have so all of the things that you are involved in you know your activities the 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 projects that you are taking up you share all of those details with them because they are not just a slave they are a friend and uh, here jesus is saying you are uh, you i uh, you know all of you whom i have now um, chosen to be part of my wine uh, all of you are no longer just slaves uh, but rather i am sharing my uh, my business with you he says a servant does not know his master's business instead i have called you friends for everything that i learned from my father i have made known to you so um if we choose to not walk in love you know if we refuse to put off the old self if we continue to hold uh, a bitterness and rage and what is that malice and all those terms which were used you know in in our Ephesians chapter 4 if we continue to hold on to those things uh, how are you going to participate in the father's business uh, because you see he's revealing his heart to us he's talking about all of his kingdom um, you know goals and his kingdom purposes and it, and everything that he does is driven by love it's at the core of everything that he does. His entire father's business is uh, driven by this one core thing, love. Now, if you are not living in that attitude of love and you are continuing to hold all these things in your heart, uh, these grudges, and um, and then you speak, when you speak, you, you slander the person or you, you, know, you express malice through your words and you're doing all of that, then you cannot really be like a friend who is participating in his business. Uh, rather, you're distancing yourself from him and saying, OK, Lord, I'll be your slave. I you know I'll just serve you because you know this is a job that needs to be done. And I accept the fact that you are Lord, so I will serve you. But friend, then I would have to think the way you think. I would have to share in your feelings. I would have to have the same uh, you know, um, emotional uh, uh, love and care uh, that you feel for this person and uh, if we say that we are not willing to do that then we would not be his friends in the truth so you see there's a lot of there's a lot at stake over here this command um, uh, involves many things uh, it plays it keeps us safe inside the fence of his protection we can remain in his love but also the other side of it is that we become like his friend we have the same priorities that he has. The same way he forgives, we, we too are willing to forgive and let go. The same way he is showing kindness and compassion to someone who is being cruel, in the same way we too reach out to that person with kindness and compassion, even though they are being cruel. Uh, so uh, we are participating in his business, and we are becoming intimate friends with him. Uh, so. Um, Jesus has opened himself up completely to his disciples. He has shared everything that the Father has given to him with them. And now it is up to them uh, how they wish to live. The attitude that they wish to adopt uh, will choose uh, to show. You know, it will show whether they are uh, serving him as slaves or whether they are literally being his friends. Uh, you know, so that's the um, great contrast that we see over here. Now, uh, verse 16 and 17, if someone could read out, please. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you asked for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. OK, so uh, usually in those days, uh, you know, the people would look at the teachers who are coming to their villages. And then if they're impressed by someone, they would say, OK, fine. I think from now on, I'm going to become a disciple of this particular teacher. So they would go and choose the teachers. But over here, in this case, we see the teacher coming and choosing each of those disciples. You know, In the same way, he has reached out to each one of us. Uh, and uh, now we have a personal walk with him because he came searching after us. We are the lost sheep that he came searching after us. and he personally picked up each one of us. So uh, the teacher has chosen each one of us. And now yeah, I know uh, it is our choice whether we want to abide in him 
and bear much fruit and at the center of all this fruit bearing at the very core of it is this command because again he repeats it in verse 17 he says this is my command love each other so there's no getting away from it there's no escaping it uh, we are called to uh, live in love we have called to put off the old self we have to uh, allow ourselves to be made new in the attitude of our mind like it says in Ephesians 4 if we cooperate with him he will renew us in the attitude of our mind so that we can put on the new self and walk in love towards others and then Jesus goes on to talk about hate uh, that would be in verses 18 to 25 as uh, so that's a rather, a rather large passage we will not really get into it uh, in detail but this is basically what the Lord says. He says, um, you know, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. So Jesus is uh, saying, you know, in the same way that I have been hated, you also will be hated. Uh, so do not be surprised or shocked. Uh, there will be uh, there will be persecution, and um, um, so we saw the benefits that we have, the joy that is there, the fellowship that we have, the protection that we enjoy being you know safe inside the the fence of his uh, love. We saw all of that, but now Jesus is pointing out the other side, which is persecution. That also will be there. Um, so Jesus is not promising a problem free life; rather, he's uh, promising a life in which there will be trials, but he will be there with us in all of those trials to strengthen us and to uh, uh, you know uphold us. Uh, so uh, he says that just as I have undergone persecution, you too will be persecuted. Um, so that entire passage talks about that. Uh, then we have... Uh, the last portion verses 26 and 27 if someone could just very quickly read out 26 and 27 but when the helper comes whom i will send to you from the father the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father he'll bear witness about me and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning yes so uh he is the one who will uh you know um remind us of truths uh which jesus has taught and he is the one who makes the logos into Rema in our hearts, you know, because we have the entire word of God in front of us. You know, it's there, it's all there in our Bible. But the Holy Spirit, as and when we need it, he takes one bit of scripture and he kind of imprints it upon our heart for that particular situation that we are going through. And so he he witnesses in our hearts. Uh, about specific things which we require for that particular time, for that particular situation. And uh, so we take hold of those things and we walk in his, you know, in his word. And uh, so the Holy Spirit is the one. Uh, if in our human limitation, it's difficult for us to always remember all of the logos. But the Holy Spirit who is there with us, he is that witness. He constantly reminds us of the things which we need for those particular situations. He um, kind of... Uh, uh, enlivens it and brings it to our attention in a special way and when we hold on to that and we act upon it uh, you know we are able to fulfill god's purposes and we are able to glorify the father so um, these are all some of the things that we could cover in um, today's class uh, any questions that anyone wants to ask otherwise we can close with a word of prayer Mm, we don't have any questions all right then shall we close yeah lord we just thank you so much for today's class thank you a lot for all the things that we could uh, cover and lord even as we uh, have gone through so many important things remind us a lot of these things as and when required help us a lot to walk in love uh, in this passage a lot you have again and again repeated that it is so important for us to walk in love because that is at the center, at the core of your father's business. So if we want to be involved in that, if we want to walk with you and um, accomplish all these things which you have set before us, we would need to walk in love. 
so help us the lord to do that help us to always abide in you so that lord we can be safe and secure in you thank you lord in jesus name amen thank you so much for patiently listening and uh, participating thank you so uh, see you all next week amen thank, thank you ma'am thank you so much